you have to understand that that a human being can take a certain a certain reality, but this is not reality. This is above reality. This is something which normally doesn't happen. That 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 they just take you here, there. You you don't know what's going to happen next. You you see the dogs running around you. you you're being put on a on a, on a on a truck. You don't know where you're going. They tell you if you're going on the truck, you're gonna you're gonna be killed. So you are, you cannot even it doesn't penetrate. You you cannot cope with it. You you you're like in a in a trance. I was put on this earth for a specific purpose. And this is when I come to my book and I say, I'm their voice. Because six million lost their voices and I am their voice. I am explaining to people what happened. Whether it happened to me when I, that I was born in Czechoslovakia, or it happened to people who were born in Germany, or people who were born in Poland, or in Holland, or in Denmark, we experienced some of the same things, not all the same, but some of the same things, and the end was most of the time the same. Czechoslovakia was occupied in, in like, where I was a student was 1938, in October 1938. And then, in 15th of March 1939, uh, they marched into Prague. And this is why I call myself a witness to history, because I saw history in front of me. I was supposed to be named Francisca after my grandmother. My mother's mother, her name was Francisca. But my father thought it was terrible because I'm, they're not going to call me Franziska, but they're going to call me Franzl. Because where I lived, they spoke German, so they would call, you know, they said Franzl, and he surely didn't want a Franzl. So he named me Liselotte, and now I'm very happy about that. <laughs> there are not many around. My mother called me Liesel, you know, like a little girl. And two years later, my brother was born. His name was, in German, we called him Hans, and in Czech it's Hanusz. My father died when I was three and a half, and my brother was one and a half. But my mother was a fantastic person. She was very hardworking and intelligent and bright. And, and she was very strict with us. She didn't let us get away with anything. First of all, we were not allowed to play together because we would be fighting. She had a store, and she just didn't have time but she was in the store, and she just couldn't, didn't have the nerve for it that, 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 that we would be fighting. She said, we, I should bring a friend, and he should bring a friend, and like we would play with a friend. So like this, we wouldn't be fighting, which was a very good idea. She had to go to shop for our store in the city. She had to go to Pilsen. And when I was a little girl, when she went to, to Pilsen, I was in, I was in charge of the, of the store. I was felt very important, so especially if somebody came and we didn't have something. So I, we had a book to write down, Mrs. So-and-so, she wanted uh, some green buttons, but we didn't have it. You know, like I made an order. So this is how I grew up. We lived in this small village, which was called then, in, in, in the late Earth 30s, it was called Sudeten, and um, it was occupied by the Germans in 1938, in, on the, in the fall of 1938. We fled with the, with the soldiers, because there were Czech soldiers were stationed in our village, and we fled to another village where we had some relatives. And my mother came from a family of ten children, and most of them lived in Prague. And so she got in touch with them, and so we took the train, on, and we arrived on the 28th of October, 1938, in Prague. So we came to the, to the station in Prague, and there were some of our relatives waiting for us, and they took us to an uncle and aunt, and there they decided 
because we didn't have anything. We had no nothing, you know, we left everything. And they decided that who's going to live where. And so my mother moved in with her sister, who was also a widow, and her um, brother, who was a bachelor. So she, she went to live with them. I was um, told to, to live with my uncle, the oldest brother of my mother and his wife. And my brother lived with a cousin. And that's how we how we started. And I would go and see my mother on Sundays or something like that. So I went to school. It was uh, Dece um, November, December, January, February, and it was spring, a beautiful spring day. I went to school. And that day was the 15th of March. I left from school and I had to go to the main street and the German moved, the German army was moving in and people were standing on the sidewalk, were crying and, and that's when my life changed forever. Jewish children were allowed to finish the school year but were not allowed to go anymore to public school. We were not allowed to go to a park, we were not allowed to go on a sidewalk, we were not allowed to go to a theater, not a movie, no, no nothing. And then we had to give away. The first thing they took away was the radios, the jewelry, the furs, the art, and musical instruments. You have to understand the German mind, the German, uh, not the mind, but their makeup, just like their language. It's precise. So is everything they do is extremely precise. And they have it all mapped out, how, what they're going to do next. It was all written there, they had it all prepared. And so now was the time to get rid of us. Do you often think about what happened to you? Very often. Sometimes I'm, I'm dreaming that, um, that the Germans are chasing me. Does it happen often to you? Not as often, but happens once in a while. You were born where? In Kalish. I lived in the Warsaw Ghetto. You lived in the, for how many years? Maybe two, two, two years. Half. You had to report for, for work every day. And you were assigned to different uh, places, different locations. Cleaning the streets from snow, being sent to different uh, locations, like to the palace in Warsaw or to other places. Just the, all, all kind of works. I also work for the German post office in Warsaw, cleaning windows. And the ghetto was closed while we were there for a while. I don't remember how, how long, but. I was working together with my mother. My mother was always afraid that they will take me because I am still a child. And they made a selection. They were looking after children and all persons. Every day? Uh, not every day, a very few days. And they told us to, to stay one after the other. And my mother was, she was the first one, I was after her. And after me was a group of children. When she looked back, she saw that I am together with the children. I look like the children. So she decided that she will go on my place and I will be the first one she will be after and after the children but this day 
they didn't look, the German didn't look children, old men, not only one right and one to the left. This is the reason that I, I remained and she went to Treblinka, you understand? If he, we wouldn't change the places, she will be the one who remains. So in this day I lost my mother. It was the 18th of August, 42. Ah, what was the future of the people, the Jewish people in the ghetto? Without future. They sent them where? To Treblinka, most of them to Treblinka. What was your father's name? My father's name was Maya. Thank you. Your mother and sister, what were their names? What my mother's think? name was Deborah, and my sister's name was uh, Bronya. But they, they were sent to from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka, and that's the last I heard of them. Wiktory osobno, które wchodziły tu na ten teren. To była droga do Treblinki. I tutaj, gdzie jest pani? Jestem, jestem. So this was the road to Treblinka, because you see the tracks, and from those tracks, exactly in this spot, there were uh, another set of tracks going uh, directly to Treblinka. So This is where we are right now, right? Where we are right Baraki. So the barracks were here, you see, and the ludzie wychodzili z wagonów i szli tutaj i wchodzili tą bramę, 
tutaj była brama i wchodzi pomiędzy dwoma dużymi barakami, które stały w tą stronę. So would, would I mężczyźni to, szli to, po to, prawej to, stronie i kobiety po lewej stronie. Dobrze, tłumaczę. So the people would, would uh, get off the trains, right? And that's where they would enter, you know, to the main gate between two large barracks. And uh, 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 the men on the mężczyźni po prawej. Słuchaj, mężczyźni po prawej. The men on the right side, the, the women on the left side. I po lewej kobiety. Chodziły do, do, do baraku. Uh, the women, right? And the men. Jak mężczyźni tutaj stanęli pod barakiem, doszli chłopcy i rozdawali sznurki. Mm -hmm. So when the men would stop, you know, near the barrack, uh, there were some chłopcy, młodzi chłopcy. Tak, młodzi chłopcy. Ale, ale oni byli stąd z obozu. Stąd z obozu, tak Żydzi, there, też więźniowie. There were some uh, young boys, also the prisoners here, and also Jewish, and they would come to come up to them and give them some uh, threats. And, Kazali and, usiąść i zdjąć buty. And they would I tymi sznurkami people, związać do pary. And they would tell people to take off uh, the men, take off their shoes and tie them together with those those ropes and those uh, laces. laces. But they were like, not laces, but like kind of like... A, a potem? Był rozkaz, by, ale rumpte, wszystko zdjąć. And then they would be told to take off everything, right? First in German and... Yeah. Teraz, jak ja przyjechałem do obozu... When he came here... Ja przyjechałem z Opatowa Kieleckiego, nie z Częstochowy. He was sent bo myśmy here mieszkali w Warszawie, uciekliśmy do Opczota. So he wasn't sent here from Częstochowy. I nagle podchodzi he, do mnie taki work. jeden chłopiec i chce mi dać ten sznurek. Ja biorę, widzę, że znajoma twarz. Ja mówię, skąd ty jesteś? I ja pytam się, jak, skąd ty jesteś? To odpowiedź, a skąd ty jesteś? Tam mówię, Warszawa, Częstochowa, Opatu, Częstochowa. Jak się nazywa? Same gwiry. Powiedz, że jesteś murarzem. And then at that time the, the SS... Uh, uh, so, how do you call them? SS soldiers, SS... Uh, Mur, assessment. Assessment, right. Came and he was looking for a bricklayer, right? The SS man uh, told him to, to, to get into a barrack. I tak jak jestem w baraku, ja widzę, że nagle wszyscy stoją nago, so, szmaty leżą tutaj ubrania, was, paczki, co uh, wszyscy przywieźli. He was in the barrack when he saw all the people all I wszyscy naked, kierują na tą the, the drogę, And kierują ich led... do tej ścieżki, która prowadziła do gazowych komór. So everybody was My jesteśmy were, tu! The, to the, the ten cały right? kawałek, co widzicie, we to jest ten cały, ta, ta cała część. Z tym tylko tak, tak, tak te wagony stoją tu, tutaj był tryb, tu były baraki, baraki i to tylko było ten odcinek, jest w tym to odcinkiem, jest to, tak? to jest ten odcinek, to ja wziąłem, bo to był okay, zasadniczy so this, okay. w Ja wytłumaczę pani, pani, Proszę. so this, this, uh, this uh, part, right, uh, it's a close up of this part, so he drew it again here, right? And that's where, where he, when he was in a barrack, he saw people naked, standing naked, and then they were led all of them to, to gas chambers, what turned out to be gas chambers. My, my brother came during the night and he said that he is going to go as a volunteer with my mother. And I said, listen, if that's what you want to do, not that I see that you will be able to help her in many ways, but if you want to do that, by all means, go. So they left. And three months later, I was called up, it was the 15th of December, 43, and I, that when I went, that when I went to Auschwitz. Of course, you know, you don't know where you're going. I was very sick, I had high temperature. They could care less. They put you in these railway cars and you go off. And they always they always transport you during the night. You know, you go into the trains in late afternoon and then during the night you are being taken wherever. And then early in the morning we arrived in we didn't know where it was. And so the, the doors opened, there was lots of screaming and yelling, and the, the SS men were there with their dogs and, and, and their guns, and 
and then there were these young boys in the in the pajamas running around in the striped things and and they would say don't go on the trucks don't go on the trucks because if you go on the trucks you go to god but you have no choice you have to go on the trucks they drove us into this camp no, and yes and they would say do you know where you are they said no and they would say it's Ossichimi, Ossichimi. you're in auschwitz And so they took us there and uh, they divided the women from the men and uh, I was put on block uh, 11 and uh, we would go up on these bunks and we were just there a little bit and then they were out again so we went out, we had to line up and went to another block where there were young girls sitting and they were tattooing they were, and you know they knew which numbers to follow. So I became 70663 and from that day on I wasn't anymore Lieslot Epstein but I was 70663. And from there they took us out again and they brought us to the showers. Lucky we got water, right? They took away all our clothes and the only thing we were allowed to keep were our stockings. There was a bench that we put the stocking. So you went uh, under the shower, they gave you something on your head in case we had lice. And then, in, and then I went looking for my stockings and they weren't there. That's when I panicked because it was December, freezing cold out and no stockings. Well, I found another pair where not mine. And then we went into another room after the shower, they, they threw clothes at you. And so whatever you got, you got. The, the shoes they took away, they gave us pantoffles, you know, the, the wooden ones? It was made out of wood. Wood and, and, and a little over it, so you put your foot in, like the pantoffles, yeah. but they took away our shoes. Yeah. I have to also tell that they didn't cut our hair. We were the only women prisoners in Auschwitz, ever, whom they, that they didn't cut our hair. Then we went back and I went back on number 11 and two weeks we were not allowed to go out only to the to the washroom and to the outhouse and after two weeks we were allowed to move about and that's when i started looking from and we found out that the people who are there they came also from Terezin. so uh, my brother was there and my mother and i, I started looking for them Why do you think that you were spared? You're alive today. Do you ever ask yourself why didn't I die in the camp with the others? Why did God spare me? I don't know. Uh, I, I was very dizzy. I went to the neurological institute to see a doctor there. And he had the tears in the eyes because he was reading a lot of books about uh, concentration camps. And he asked me, uh, why you survive? I said, I don't know. He has the tears in the eyes. How you survive? Tell me. I said, I don't know. Because everybody wants to leave. I, I was waiting day by day. I don't know why. The number on your arm? Yes, 40,924. What, what, what was in your thoughts, on your mind, when they were placing this number on your arm? What were you thinking? I think I didn't know. Uh, we didn't know. They lie so much, the Germans. They give us a shower and they say, uh, 
your shoes you have to take out to put them near the wall because not to lose them. And most of them they were in the crematorium. I was not because I was very young. But I'm sure they did that with my mother. She was not even 50. And they burned right away. The most I, I am against is my little sister. She was 12, Teresa. She was blonde with blue eyes. And my mother, those two, I really, really miss them till today. My father died in, in Greece when we were in Greece, before the war. What did you wear in the camps? A blue dress, striped, blue and white. Full with lice. Lice, no, lice. <laughs> I remember when we landed in Auschwitz, we had to line up the left side and the right side. I was on the left side, and somehow I didn't like the people I was with, elderly people and young children. So I, went, so I tried to sneak over to the other side. So the assessment saw me. He came over to me, hit me with his butt over my head. He said, you stay here. While he was busy with somebody else, I sneaked back to the, to the other line. And the line that I was originally in never made it. They were straight to the gas chambers. Who were in the other line where you went to? The people capable of work and the young people. Were they mostly men? Yeah, mostly men. But they tried to have people that were healthy to send them to work. And after we were selected, we had to go stripped completely, take a shower, put on the tattoo, and, uh, and send us to different assignments, to different blocks. Were you given a uniform? Yeah. Could you describe it to us? Well, it was the Pashak or the stripes, what we, what we call. Blue and gray, I think. We were given a, a uniform, a tag with a number, with the Star of David, to make sure that they know who we are. Tylko co? 10 czy 30 chłopców młodych zostawili i wprowadzili do tego baraku, gdzie ja byłem, nagich już, ja byłem ubrany i Ukrainiec stał koło nich i pilnował. And then there were 30 young boys naked who were also led to the barracks with him, next to him, right? I oni oczyścili ten cały teren to z tych brzych, z ubrań, z paczek i zanieśli na tą ogromną górę sto osób ubrań, które tam były. So those boys cleaned up the place from from the all the clothes left and the buty też czy nie? Wszystko, buty, osobno tutaj buty, buty. All of those clothes and shoes were taken to this big pile of clothes and then big pile of shoes. A na około stali więźniowie, którzy sortowali te rzeczy. They had prisoners who were sorting, you know, the clothes and the shoes and tak. I każdy miał pracę, główną pracę, wszyscy mieli przy sortowaniu tej odzieży, przy wyjmowaniu pieniędzy, przy sortowaniu spodni osobno, kurtki osobno, płaszcze osobno, wełna osobno. Ci najważniejsze szmaty, który był bardzo wielkim produktem dla Niemców i jeszcze jedna rzecz, na prześcieradłach były rozrzucone prześcieradła, na których były papiery, and dokumenty, dyplomy, also, uniwersyteckie, also, also papers, matury, dokumenty, uh, wszystko co diplomas, miało jakiś kawałek papieru, to wszystko było na całej tych i ten pierwszy dzień mój forarbeiter powiedział do mnie weź te, 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 te papiery, papiery mm -hmm. i zanieś tam, tu. 
taki mały ogrodzony okay. teren. So the first time, the first day of his work there, right? He was told by one of the um, Nazis uh, to pick up all the papers and take them to the small uh, area that was surrounded by the. I tam poszedłem i znalazłem się u tak, przy takim płocie z czerwoną flagą, czerwony krzyż. Mm -hmm. I tutaj byli mężczyźni starsi, kobiety stare, starzy, mm -hmm. których rozbierali. I ja doszedłem, tutaj były przejście i miałem rzucić i zobaczyłem sto strupów. Sto strupów. To się nazywał Nazaret. Okay, so this this area was called Nazaret and this was the area with the red cross, right? Flag. And there were some older people uh, inside and naked. And then when he went to this um, this ravine, I guess, uh, uh, he he saw, you know, uh, dead bodies. Tu przeprowadzali ludzi, którzy nie byli zdolni iść do gazu, so którzy przeszkadzali w tej szybkości, szybkości w tej, żeby nie było przeszkód. I ich tu prowadzili i, so i, leka i mówili, że będą badani przez lekarza. So I on się o każde nie. They were told that they would be um, checked by um, Doctor. doctors uh, and nurses, right? So they would go willingly and what they would eventually do, they would all kill them right there because they, they were not able to walk to the gas chambers. They were slowing that's down so the, the march. I wyprowadzali okay. ich tutaj so i Ukrainiec strzelał im głowy. Ukrainians killing them in the back of their heads and that's where they put the bodies. Dzień w dzień przychodziło do trzech transportów. Każdy transport miał prawie że 6 tysięcy ludzi. So every day they would have, uh, Mógł mieć 5 uh, tysięcy, mniej więcej. Birkenau was very bad. I, I, ne I, I never thought I would make it in Birkenau. I think I was there four weeks. This was like a quarantine. And we would, uh, would carry stones from one place to another, f from this place back again. We would shuffle the sand from one place to another. And we had a, a cess on top of us. Schnell, schnell, schnell. Hurry up, hurry up. What's hurry up for what? What do you think was the purpose of this? Is to see who can hold out. If somebody was too weak, the gas chamber. What was your ration? What did you receive in the morning, in the evening? In the morning, uh, we received a slice of black bread, a piece of margarine, and, and tea, warm, warm water. This was it. At, at lunch, at lunch we would be given some soup at the place of work, and in the evening the, the same thing. The same soup. Same soup, different soup. Any, any soup tasted the, the same. Well, I found out that the transport, my mother and my brother came in September, that they were there. That some people walked out and they saw some familiar faces. So I started looking for her and I did find her on block 27, which I was in 11, she was 27, it was very far. So I made my way up to her, and I found her. And she was in the first coir when I came in, and she was like in the, on the bottom. My mother was at that time 53 years old. She looked like 200. She, she was in a terrible state. A lot of people suffered from dehydration. They had diarrhea. And of course, they lost all the fluids, and so they, uh, and they died from that. So
So many of the older people died from that. When you saw a person with a white mouth, like powder, so you knew that person had diarrhea, and that that wasn't a good sign. So I, I, I went there, and I, uh, and I also found my brother. He, he was, uh, he, everybody knew him, and he, he was painting the chimneys. You know, we had the chimneys in the middle of the barracks, and he was painting the chimneys, and many people knew him. Um, I thought that perhaps I, sh I should have a way that I would be able to get some more food for her. And the only way I could figure it out was to work, to carry the, the soup. The soup was being transported by girls. There were huge barrels. The barrels had ears, and through the ears we had poles. And the thing was that you picked up the soup at the kitchen and you brought it to the block where they told you. And afterwards you were allowed then you picked up your barrel to scrape it out. You had a spoon and you had an ashes, we called it. You know, it was an aluminum little pot, like the soldiers have. I was so proud that I had some food for my mother, and I rushed to see her, but she couldn't eat anymore. So I don't know whether it was one day or two days. And I come to the block, and she wasn't there anymore. So they told me that she was in the back. They put people who were sick with diarrhea on the back, in the last coir. It, it was like straw covered with a, a jute thing cover. But there, they only were lying on the boards, on the wooden boards, because, God forbid, they would dirty those the straw. So that's where I found her. And that's where she died. And it was that was the fourth of January, uh, nineteen forty-four. She, you know, she had a very strong heart, and she really couldn't die. It was, it was awful. I stopped um, where my brother was. I don't remember now the, the the number of the block, but I think it was. 18 maybe or something. I know it was on the other side that I know. And, uh, you know, you couldn't go in. You were not allowed to go in. But there was always a guard, or like a young person who was standing there. And I would say that I want to see my brother. And he came out. And I told him that that mother died. And he just turned away and he went in. He was he was very attached to her. Don't, he went voluntarily with her. Yes. And she was called up. He called. He went, and he says he wants to go with her. When we arrived, we had to sign a paper that after six months there's going to be special treatment, right? But who knew what it was? Nobody knew what it was. But the, the time arrived when the first transport, the bro my brother's transport was there, six months. So on the 7th, I believe, 7th of March, they called out all the numbers from that transport. It was very simple, you know, they had a list of all the people who came and they would be standing in front of the block and they would say number 100,000, two or through 100,000, and all the people had to come out, right? And they lined them up and they moved them and they all went to Camp A. You know the, the barracks which are still standing? Yeah. And they killed them all. They put them on tr on trucks and they took them to the crematorium. And it was during the night, and we heard them singing. They were singing the Czech national anthem, and they were singing Hatikva. 
and we could hear them sing. And the next day they would let us out because during the night there was a quarantine, we were not allowed to go out or anything. We were just wandering around. We were, I think that was the most difficult time for all of us because we knew that they all were killed during the night. It was close to 5,000 Czech Jews. And uh, so we knew what it meant, special treatment. So we knew that we have three months. And in May, they brought in, I think, around 7,000 new inmates from Terezin. So they filled up the camp. Can you describe me the crematorium of Auschwitz as you remember them? What I remember was heavy barbed wire at the entrance, all around like this way. Heavy barbed wire, and there was only one one gate to open. When we brought the bodies from different blocks. So we had to leave them in front of the of the gate. We would never get in. Because once you you got in you don't come out. And when we delivered the bodies they were completely naked. Because people were just taking clothes, shoes, socks. Oh, you could see the smoke coming out. You can smell the bodies. Oh, I was always thinking, when will I be there? What do you see when you think of it? I see the chimney and me in front of them, lined up, waiting to, to go in. In our present day, how do you deal with your memories? Do you try to suppress them when they come to you? No. I just try to live with them. Three times I was supposed to go to the crematorium. But the first time the truck has done gasoline, the second time was no gas there anymore, and the third time they told me, you come out from there and go to work. So I escaped three times. Another time I was very sick with typhus, and they hide me under the mattresses, straw mattresses. 
So the SS they did see me, but uh, I was very, very sick. Somebody, I don't remember anymore, gave me garlic. I burned my stomach because it was empty, but I had no fever anymore. And I was okay. I continued to work. W tym okresie dochodziła do zima i w zimie na wiosnę z tysiąca więźniów zostało się tylko 400. I zaczęły być różne komandy. Jedna komanda, ja pracowałem w komandzie, która robiła te parkany. Te yeah, wszystkie so parkany reperowaliśmy wewnątrz, ciągle były jakieś... So each commando, Wychodziliśmy each na, na zewnątrz, for, uh, otoczeni Ukraińcami, tak, so skierowani do... Of... W zimie nastąpiła epidemia tyfusu. In winter they, they, they had I komendant Gale, Galewski, inżynier Galewski z Łodzi, zorganizował tak, że tych chorych, którzy mogli jeszcze stanąć na nogach przy apelach, Potem wsadzał ich tu do, dek, do tych dwóch baraków połączonych. Takie same baraki są w, w Szwicu i w Majdanku. To są stajnie, bo tutaj były te droższe, te lepsze rzeczy. I roz, Żydzi z Rosji, to znaczy z, z Białego Stoku, z Grodna, przyjeżdżali z futrach. I tutaj były te magazyny puter i dlatego... Tych... Uh, they would often come wearing, you know, fur coats. I ci chorzy leżeli tam, so those sick aż skończyła się praca. I jeden z nich, dziennikarz z Łodzi, miał prawdopodobnie jakieś 42 stopnie gorączki, so zupełnie them, był w malignie, wyszedł w ten sposób. I SS-owiec. So he left the barracks. Mm -hmm. I SS-owiec, którego my nazywaliśmy Malach Mawet, anioł śmierci, z Rinonią zapytał się, bys tu nyś gezunt, czy jesteś chory? One of the assessment, you know, whom they call the angel of death, right? The prisoners would call him the angel of death, ask him uh, if he was uh, sick. I zaprowadził go tutaj, so do Lazaretu. W tym momencie, w tym momencie komendant Galewski Kazał mi złapać jakieś szmaty i zanieść do Lazaretu tam. I ja stanęłem tutaj na dole. On już był tu rozebrany. Ukrainiec stał po niego nich. SS-owiec też stał. Nagle on łapie tego SS-owca za nogi i krzyczy Herr, es, Herr Bachmann, hier ist konspiracion. Tu jest konspiracja. I ja się zacząłem śmiać. I pokazałem, że on jest nienormalny i Kapo też pokazał, że nienormalny. Ukrainiec nie rozumie po niemiecku, to złapał go i dał mu kulę w głowę. It was a group of uh, Polish people who worked together with, uh, with Jewish and uh, they made a special uh, way to run away from uh, ghetto. Uh, it was a wall, you know, a wall, a very big one, a very high one, and on the top of the wall was uh, glass, broken glass. The German one was outside the ghetto. 
he was walking all the time and looking if somebody doesn't uh, leave the ghetto. But in ghetto, they put a ladder and uh, a claim on this. And uh, suddenly, from the other side, the Polish men told, no, 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 don't, don't go because the German is very close. And uh, so I went back and then I, for the second or for the third time, the German was uh, far from this place. So I jumped, but the Polish man, he held me. And he booked me to, to a very close house from the wall, from the wall. We're together, you know, to, to connect those two barracks uh, with some of some... Korytarzem i małym pokojem, nad, nad którym i nad korytarzem był zbiornik na wodę, so żeby it, Niemcy mogli w kąpielowym typu right, używać wody. They wanted to connect those two barracks and they would have a room with some water so that Germans could... Nasze bałkomando, składające się z więźniów, to wszystko więźniów, budowali. Mm -hmm. so, uh, budowali to i zorientowali się na w jakim celu ten pokoik może być. Przecież nie do mieszkania. Mm -hmm. To jest pokój, małe okienko z tyłu, które wychodziło na tą stronę. I zrozumieli, że to będzie arsenal na broń. Oh, so, the, so the prisoners, uh, you know, when, when they were told, you know, what, what was going to be built there, they realized that it was, that it was the room was really uh, was going to be a, a, an arsenal. Ale nie było drzwi. But there were no, there were no doors. O, Niemcy przywieźli jakieś drzwi z getta. They brought some żelazne, doors from silne, uh, ale nie miały zamku steel, right? i nie miały no, zawiasów no. i nasi to pachowcy, no którzy się right? znajdowali mm -hmm. w tym miejscu w getcie. Mm -hmm. so some of the prisoners who... Zrobili, zreperowali ten zamek i zrobili klucze. Zamiast prisoners... jeden Niemcom co dali, mieliśmy drugi schowany. Okay, so the prisoners, you know, when, when they got the, the door, the steel door, right, with no locks, they fixed the door, they put locks, but they also made keys and they made two sets of keys. One for them, they, they um, hid it and one for the Germans. So the Germans didn't know that there was another key to the door. 2 sierpnia, ale w 1943 roku, o drugiej pół do drugiej, chłopcy, którzy byli czyścicielami butów, czy do, e, oni o, u, układali im te o, wszystko, czyścili ich ubrania. So, to są młodzi mm, chłopcy, którzy um, mieli do 15 lat, że oni się tutaj kręcili, im wolno było. Mnie nie wolno było wejść tu. Jak ja weszedł, to był rozstrzelany. Jeden z chłopców weszedł tutaj, so otworzył boys... arsenał, zamknął się i wiedział, że już nie wyjdzie yeah. żywy. So one of the boys went inside, but locked himself from the inside, right? And he, he wouldn't leave the, the, the room alive. He I zaczął wynosić away. broń, wyrzucać broń z tego małego okienka, przerzucał karabiny i gran. I o trzeciej 
trudno określić trzecia, czy dzieści, trzecia. Nikt nie patrzał na zegar, tylko nie mieliśmy zegar. Ale po południu, panie, po południu about three, rzu zostały rzucone granaty na zbiornik benzyny, który tu był. To zaczął płonąć. Ten, ten i ten barak już został spalony, zaczął płonąć. I zaczęła być walka. Ukraińcy tu byli i na wieżach. Zwierz zaczęli strzelać do nas. So from that, those towers, because you see the towers were in the corners, right? And on the, those towers there were Ukrainians who started to shoot, you know, to prisoners. Na około Treblinki. Na Around około. Była otoczona zasiekami przeciwko czołgom. Takiej wysokości, ze drutami połączonymi krucieńtymi. Treblinka, the camp was surrounded by barbed wire, right? So uh, very thick barb barbed wire, so there was no way to... Żeby łapać ręk, nogi, żeby nie można było right. wpaść so there was no do tego. Way to, to get out, right? I, mean, I pierwsza was... fala więźniów, która uciekała tędy, So the first, the first wave of prisoners was Została escaping, zabita, right? ścięta od razu karabinem maszynowymi dwoma camp, i tutaj one dostały się grup. Myśmy z karabinem, jeszcze Kochen miał i, i ksiądz, weszliśmy, my pracowaliśmy tutaj, weszliśmy tu, zeszliśmy i spotkałem mały wózek i Alfreda Bema, który mnie wyciągnął, został zabity. On nam przywiózł wóz na wózkach te karabiny. On robił Zaubermacher, on robił czystość. I Galewski go specjalnie zrobił, bo on się kręcił po niemieckiej dzielnicy, bo ci Ukraińcy brudzili. I zaczęli uciekać więźniowie tędy i tędy. Ja uciekłem tędy i przez moich kolegów zabitych na ciałach ich, ja przeskoczyłem tą te zasieki So the first wave of prisoners who, you know, who, who were escaping the camp were killed, right? And, and they were escaping this way and that way. And Mr. Willenberg went this way and then uh, because of the bodies piling up, right, he was able to uh, jump over the fence. Zeł. Our day came closer and closer. It was uh, June already, 1944. What we didn't know was that the invasion took place. We didn't know that, right? And Germany was being bombed day and night. And so they decided that they're going to send about 4,000 of young inmates to, to work in Germany. In order to do that, you have to go through selection to pick out the ones you want and the ones you don't want. 
And so I know it was Mengele who did the selection. Well, how do you do that? You get undressed completely. You carry your clothes on your right arm because the left arm they need for your number. And he stands in front of you and then the SS stands beside them because he, they watch him what he does because effectively he was doing this. And they were watching. One day this was for life and one day this was for life. And they watched it and they wrote down the numbers for the ones who chose to live. Because the ones who didn't choose to live, they, they didn't have to write down the number. So he chose me to live. I am a fatalist. And I tell you, especially then, I suffer from psoriasis. Can you imagine when I had to get naked in front of him and I would have been covered with psoriasis? I would be sitting here, right? But just then, I had nothing. I was clean, nothing. So he chose me to live. I came to Hamburg and maybe three weeks later, I was covered. And that's why I'm a fatalist. I mean, I was a fatalist before, but this really did it. And uh, what was horrible was um, the, the, the guy who was in charge of us, uh, the prisoner. Before that, we had a prisoner. He was, a, he was horrible. We got a new one by the name of Billy. Billy was very good. And he was a saboteur. He had a green triangle. And he, before the selection, he would go to mothers with small children. And he says, listen, we're going to have a selection. If you want to live, you have to leave the children here. Well, nobody did, of course not. The next day, we walked to the women's camp, and, and they all went to, and they, all the others, there were 10,000 or I don't know, they went to, they were gas. So they took, 2,000 men and 2,000 women, approximately. And the men were sent to Schwarzheide. And so, yes, and we were in, in the women's camp and they hated us with a passion because there were inmates there since 42 who didn't have hair and we all had hair. I mean, this was something. And, and then they knew that we are not going to stay there, so they really didn't like us. But we understood. We understood perfectly well. We were the lucky ones. They were there so long and, and, and they are going to stay and we are going to be leaving. We call it that death march because whoever couldn't walk, they just put them aside and one bullet in the back of the head and that is it. The Germans, the assessment that was escorting our group, he had a suitcase. So I went over and asked him to let me carry his suitcase because I knew as long as uh, I carry, I carry his suitcase, I'm safe. So we were marching toward the uh, Katowice or Gleibitz. And, and uh, when we came to the, to the train station, not the station, it was a side railing. We, when we came, the people started to run in different directions. So they, they started to shoot. And a friend of mine died in my hands. And he said, then leave me alone here and you keep running. So I started to run and I, I approached a farmer's uh, house and I wanted to sneak into the into the into the barn. But he came out and saw me and he said, okay. 
you can stay overnight. But I was bleeding, I didn't realize I was shot. So he said, come into the house, have something to eat, and the next day you have to go. So I'm coming into the house and a German soldier was sitting there. <laughs> so he tells me, don't be afraid of me. I am in the same situation as you are. I'm, to, I'm trying to find my unit. And uh, don't be afraid of me. So I showed him my wand. So he asked me to, to, to take off my shirt. He patched me up, he cleaned me up, put some bandages on. Then the following day I was taken to the, to the brick factory where I was supposed to wait until the Russians will come because you could hear the guns already. You never went back to Auschwitz? No. I, I didn't... I didn't miss Auschwitz. Only God know if it's a God, because sometimes I believe in God, but sometimes I say, I say myself, why he sent us there? And uh, another thing, why he took me out from there? Then must exist a God, because every time I ask him something, he did to me. Ravensbrück, that is the camp that I was. I was in Auschwitz, Malchow, Ravensbrück, and Birkenau. Thank you. On a personal level, um, there are some people, to, even today, who believe that the Holocaust never happened. What do you have to say about these people? Or They're crazy. <laughs> It's stupid not to believe. I have so many things to show that was concentration camp. It's stupid to think like this. There are many people they can say that was true. I was in four camps. Auschwitz, Birkenau, Malhof, Ravensbrück. They are lies. They can say what they want. That's my family. My cousins and me and my little sister. In 1943, when we were taken by the Germans. That is me, that is me, and that is Teresa, my little sister. She was born in crematorium. I would like to know where you worked after you were released from the camp. I was in Paris. I worked for the Radio Diffusion Francaise. And uh, I was a student in uh, medicine because I finished my, my BA in Greece. I was young. Then I was volunteer for the American Army. I was volunteer, I was working there. And I was working on Service Social de Jeunes. And here I was volunteer for the American Army. I received this here that was a ribbon from Harry Truman, the President of the United States. I was cute, eh? Yeah. Always smiling. Now I am always in a bad mood. (laughs) 
the word bystander. This is like you you go on the street, somebody falls, and you don't go to their aid. You just walk by. You're a bystander. You don't want to get involved. You're a bystander. And so there were many people who were bystanders, who never did anything. I am looking at it that there is a purpose to my life. I will show you some of the letters I received, and it will show you that by speaking to young people, I create a positive image of human beings. I, I create the, the, the positive for them that uh, I tell them always, without hope, there's no tomorrow. And then there were young men running around in striped uniforms, like pajamas, we called it. And they said, don't go on the truck, because if you go on the truck, go to God. You know, people ask me, how did you feel? What did you do? Well, as I said, we were angry that the world forgot us that they let us rot there, that, let, that they could kill millions of people, not just Jews, they killed prisoners, as Russian prisoners, Poles, gypsies. And what did they do? Nothing. Nothing. They could have saved some of us, but they forgot. Like we don't know what to do. The young people here don't know what to do, and here in Darfur people are being killed every day. What do you do about it? Do you do anything about it? No. But to organize, to press your politicians, go out and do something. Don't let the people be killed just because they are black. In one time it was the Jews, now it's the blacks. But nobody does anything. I am a little person, when I go to schools, and I go to many schools, not only in Montreal, but I also go to the United States, and I tell the young people, you have the power. Since I was spared my fate, and, and my fate was to live, so I have to do that. So I am the one who is, going to, who is telling this story, this experience. And this is why I call myself a witness to history. What message would you leave to the young generation? Never give up. And if there's no hope, there's no tomorrow. That's, that's really the basic message. When I speak to young people, I tell them they have lots of power. If they want, they can do, change many things. And we have to be our brother's keeper. We cannot be, very, we cannot be selfish. We, have, we should help people wherever we see that there is an injustice being done and not close our eyes and our mind to it. That's it. Thank you. What is your feeling about being a survivor? I'm glad I survived and I'm glad that I saw the end of the German third Reich. It doesn't seem to me that people learned anything of the Second World War. You mentioned right now that there is a lot of discrimination around. What kind of discrimination you are talking well, about? Different colors, different races. People don't appreciate each other. Uh, what scares you the most in our days? What scares me? People. Why do they scare you? Why do they scare me?
I don't think so that uh, the Jewish people are very much appreciated. So is it important to continue to speak about Holocaust? No, definitely. Let people be aware of it. What did you teach to your children? Tolerance. Respect for other people. How many Auschwitz survivors today? How well, many? The every, the every day, less and less. Don't forget that all, every survivor has to be 80 years old or more. That's, that's the end of the line.